Hmm. Welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome. I'm Christian. This is Lazy Devs Academy. This is Pico8 here, and we are doing a roguelike tutorial. We are making pork like, uh, and so far uh, we are progressing quite well. It's already, you know, we can like walk around, and we can already start maybe making a labyrinth. Uh, actually, that's something that we might actually do, like do like a little test level where things are happening. Now we're kind of like in a situation where we kind of start thinking about what we want to be doing. Um, full disclosure. At this point in time, when I actually programmed this, this game, I went straight for the juggler and went straight for the random number generation, the random dungeon generation, because for me it was like the exciting thing. Also, this, that was the thing I, where I wasn't sure if I can pull it off. Um, and you might be tempted to do that as well. That's something that I would not recommend if I... <laughs> I would not do it again. Don't be as silly as I am, kids. Um, I think it's a good idea when you do a game like this. Um, the reason why we're doing this, this tile set um, is that we can actually do like a little level already you know, without, without having a random, random dungeon generation. So um, we're gonna take full advantage of it and actually try to make, um, try to build a level that seems cool, that, that works well, that kind of like gives us good gameplay. And then uh, we can, uh, if that's done, you can, uh, we can actually start thinking about how to actually create those kinds of levels that we built uh, using procedural generation. Um, quite often, players or programmers think that procedural generation is a kind of like, um, um, it solves problems. Oh, I don't have to do level design, I do procedural generation. Cool. No level design, just procedural generation. But um, procedural generation, making something procedurally, is a lot more difficult. It's a lot more difficult than just making the levels. Unless we're talking about a huge amount of levels. You know, once we get into hundreds or thousands of hours investing into level design, at this point you maybe should have like just like made a good, uh, um, you know, random gen randomly generated, uh, like make an algorithm that takes care of that. But especially like for small games like this, this is actually a very inefficient way of producing gameplay. And it's not going to create like a, such good results as a human being with, you know, with the brain to sitting down and creating interesting maps. Um, it is also probably a good idea to create a map with gameplay before you make an algorithm that, um, that makes that map, just so you have like an idea for what a level is in this game just so, so you can like see what kind of like goal you want to like what kind of what kind of skills what kind of design do you want to teach to the to the ai you know so i'm trying to do to build some level build out some levels here and have some some fun with with um to kind of create a small labyrinth here. Uh, maybe some um, some details about, I haven't using, been using this too much, but maybe some details about this is with space, if you keep pressing space, you can scroll around uh, in this in this, in this, uh, in this designer here, in this map editor, and you can start, you know, edit, editing different parts of the map. These little dots here, that this grid appears when you, when you press space. These dots uh, are always at, a, at each half screen width. So you can, by just looking at the dots, you can see how big a given map is. If you scroll out, you use the scroll wheel, you can see more at the same time. So this is actually a really useful level editor. And again, um, the real advantage, the real, you know, the money shot, so to speak, of that, um, the big payoff of using uh, the, um, this tile system is that, again, that we can actually um, design the level, design a test level before we even have to think about procedural generating stuff. So that's that's something to, to think about. Okay, so let's see. Um, let me just build a small level real, real quick. And probably like, the way I will edit this probably is already running in like uh, accelerated fashion. I'll be right back. Okay, so this is kind of like... The level that I built here is not the best level in the world, but we have like a little labyrinth going on, so that's nice. Um, maybe we make sure that we start at this one one position, so we kind of like we can test this level a little bit. So here we are. We can like now uh, walk to this labyrinth. We bump against some walls. 
and our goal is to again discover this ending. Later on, we're gonna have a system where you know you slowly uncover the map, where we're gonna have like a fog of war kind of situation. But yeah, this is good. So this is kind of like the kind of game that we want to be have. I want to now because this is kind of like a bit boring. I want to start adding some elements, some tiles that we can interact with, adding some gameplay stuff. So this is going to be the part where I'm going to again start copying some um, some tiles that I prepared previously, some some different um, elements. Now again, this is part, partly inspired by um, Pixel Art M. Um, and his tile set for Midnight Dungeon, um, but some of the tiles were something that was always designed uh, myself, and of course I always do kind of like my own take on his designs. Uh, the tiles that we're going to have here is going to be a door that can open and close, there's going to be a chest, there's going to be like, actually two different chests. One chest will be uh, like a big chest for um, for like equipment kind of, um, for like you know like a big treasure chest, and the other chest is going to be like a smaller chest for um, for less impressive uh, items, but that are useful nonetheless. I think it's kind of nice to have like this kind of gameplay variation going on. <clears throat> and each chest will also have like a closed and open state because after we open a chest, I want uh, there to be like a chest that like it's kind of like a obstacle for us. And then what I also want to have is a maybe like a. Um, like uh, I want to have two pots that you can break, that kind of like, like Zelda pots where you can just like, uh, um, like you can like smash into pieces, and there sometimes maybe there's gonna be some goodies inside. And uh, I also want to have um, a, um, a something you know, a stone wall, an inscription some somewhere written on a on a on a slab of things, so that gives us tips maybe maybe. Maybe something that you can read that has like some ancient mysteries. Maybe we can like, uncover some 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 uh, legendary mysteries that way. Maybe one thing to note uh, is that the two different vases. Uh, I have actually two different vases: a bigger one and a little bit of a slimmer one. I wanted to kind of add a bit of a more variation to this game, to the visual var variation to this, by having like two different types of vases. I think most players won't pr probably even notice that there's like two different vases. But I think to me, like it's it's details like this are important to make the game visually more more attractive, visually more. Um, diverse and we're done okay so these are our, our, our new elements that we just created now here's where we're gonna start uh, utilizing this um, flag system some more mm. so first of all let's make all of the things that are not walkable or the tiles are not walkable we're gonna turn the flag one on for them so these are all not walkable we cannot walk on the vase Definitely cannot walk on the door. Now, some of these are interactable. So if you bump into them, something should happen. You might not be able to immediately walk on them, but you should be able to interact with them. So this interact, interactable thing is gonna be a second flag. That's gonna be our flag number one. That's gonna be like this orange flag. And in this case, it actually doesn't, like there's gonna be different types of interaction. So some um, tiles will trigger when you step on them when you actually move onto them and stay on them. That's gonna be something like the stairs. So I'm gonna flag the stairs with an orange as well, because if you step on the stairs, you should go to the next level. Um, but also sometimes it's gonna be something that in you is interactable when you bump into it. So we're gonna flag the doors with that, we're gonna flag the chest with that, both chests, and we're gonna flag the, uh, flag the the two vases like this. Oh, I forgot the I forgot the stone tablet. Okay, there we go. Um, right. So the stone tablet will be also interactable and also not walkable. Most of them are just not walkable, and, and, but sometimes interactable. Cool. So now let us just place some of these into our level and see if we can interact with them. So, for example, I'm going to be placing some of the doors in in those slots in here that I have prepared here. Every one of those slots will get a door like this. And you know what? Let's just let us make this a bit more interesting. Let us make this passage a bit like more twisty. Something like this. And there's maybe going to be a door uh, here. Oops, too many doors. And then here is we're going to put up some vases. 
some of them is going to be the the chunk, chunky ones. Now here we might put down a stone tablet, and there's going to be a chest somewhere here. Let's let's put down a chest here, and there's going to be a chest. You know what? Let's put a stone tablet down here at the entrance, and the small chest is going to be here. So I think now we we use pretty much every one of those tiles, except from the closed chests. These are things that we're gonna actually interact with. These will show up after we open the chest. Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yes! Okay. Okay. Um, so here, when the tile is not, uh, when, we, when, when we bump against the wall, Something we want to be doing is something like if f get tile um, now one. That's we do to check if the orange light is on. If f get tile one, then trigger bump. Let's call this trick bump. Trick bump, and then. Um, let's call it dest x and dest y. We're gonna just say like, okay, on this destination we're gonna we're gonna trigger the bump. Just thinking about maybe we want to also see. Nah, we don't have to actually know from which direction we bumped. But you know, depending on what kind of gameplay you want to add later on, maybe that's good, gonna be very important to kind of figure out you know where the, also the player is. Let's see. Now this is gonna be the, for the for trigger bumping uh, we're gonna imp implement already another thing where it's like okay if we walk on a tile and the tile has a thing then we're gonna go tr um, trig um... actually wait a minute think about this so you walk on a tile and w once you when is when you walk on a tile some an event should trigger um, this is interesting now because this should not happen before the animation plays. This should happen after animation is played. So actually we cannot put it down here, we have to put it somewhere else. Let us um, deal with this trick bump function. We might actually, so we don't have to look for the tile, we might actually go trick bump TLE dest x and dest y. So uh, the function actually already knows what kind of tile we're talking about. That's good. That could be good. So here is not. I already told you like this is this is not ideal, but I think in this case there's not so many tiles that we're going to interact with. Here we're going to check just generally what kind of tiles we're talking about. We bump into a tile, and then things are going to be happening. So if T L E equals we could simplify this a little bit we could like use an array for this but i don't think it's worth it because it might not be worth it because some of the the, the results of, of bumping into different things are not that um, serious that they re, they require their own like array and also we're dealing with very high numbers it's gonna be difficult to create this array so yeah i think we're just gonna have to do like an we're gonna we're gonna uh, steal ourselves and actually use the, um, the the big if statement here. So okay, so let's see. So um, seven and eight are the vases. Or vases, vases, vases. I never. I'm not very sure. This is going to be the small chest. This is a small chest and a big chest. Uh, 10 and 12. I'm gonna actually make the same same code for the chests. Now this is gonna be the door 13. Initially I had like a version of this game where I had doors that could be opened with keys. But I realized very quickly that's gonna be very difficult for um, to train the algorithm, uh, the level generation algorithm to place the keys at useful <laughs> locations. So I actually had to give this up. A door. Okay, so 
Um, now, later on, there's going to be like interesting things that are going to be happening. Maybe we're going to find items in the chest and stuff like that. We don't have an item system just yet, so we can't have those things just yet. But uh, we can already think about, you know, what will happen when you hit a chest, uh, hit a vase. In our case, the vase should just like disappear, and and we should have like a tile underneath. So so we're just going to go like um, M set dest x dest y one m set is a function that can would would which you can use to set a tile to a on the map to a different tile so you can swap uh, a the vase with an empty spot and that's basically you destroyed the vase So this is going to be the chest. That's kind of like a similar situation, but here's going to be a bit different because if you look at the chests, you know, we have an, like an open closed chest and the empty chest, right? And it's going to be two different kinds of chests, but look, um, we set it up so that uh, the empty chest is always to the left of the open chest. No, wait, to the, to the full chest. So we just want to like reduce the tile from by one. So it's going to be, you know, from 10 to nine and from 12 to 11. So we're just going to go like, um, we're going to do the same thing, M set, but in this case, it's going to be TLE um, minus one. Just remove, uh, uh, reduce the tile from, from by one. And again, door is going to be very similar to the vase, to the vase, vase. But we're going to still keep it in its own if statement because the vases, the vases, uh, later on, we, they may, might behave slightly differently. Let's try this. Oh, we did not do this thing. It's does, we, we have, this is going to be behaving differently because here we want like a message to pop up where something happens. Um, so that's going to be that's uh, hmm, that's going to be that's going to be difficult. Maybe that's something that we do good on the do next. But okay, we open the door. That worked. Opening the doors works. Opening the chest works. And opening this chest also works. Look at that. There's like two different sprites for different, two different sizes of chests. And then breaking the the little vases also works. Ah, oh, I love this so much. This is so good. Now I already noticed while I'm playing this, I only notice a slight inconvenience that we might have to address now, because we still have some times for the, for to the end of the episode, and I think this is something that we that's important to discuss. So something I don't like here now is how. Uh, it's kind of difficult to convey this um, in video, but if I press twice up, it just moves once. If I move left um, left down, it just moved once. Why is that so? Um, because underneath, while the animation is playing, the game is ignoring our key presses, and it only reacts to key presses once the animation has finished playing. Okay, so new challenge until the end of the episode. We have to kind of come up with some kind of like system that remembers the button presses and triggers them uh, after animation has played. And a lot of games have systems like this. If this was a fighting game, you would have something like this. Um, but I'm gonna call this butt buff. Button buff buffer. I'm 12. I'm sorry. I'm 12. So every time there's an opportunity to abbreviate button at, as butt, I will go for it. I'm like a, I'm like a scorpion on a on a <laughs> crossing the river, you know, on a on a on a turtle. And the turtle's like, no, don't don't sting sting my butt. And I'm like, no, I'm a scorpion. I have to. <laughs> So this is going to be like a variable that's kind of like remembers a button press while an animation is playing. Um, and so now this will require some restructuring here. This will require some restructuring. So for example, this part here. So let's try to do something like this. Function get but I'm 12, I told you. <laughs> um, so we have to remember um, but buff, but buff. So we're gonna get this part out, we're gonna copy it. We're gonna have a function that just goes through all of the keys, and if it finds a key that was pressed, it will return it. 
so now we're gonna go um, not just from zero to three, but to five. We're gonna actually check all of the buttons. And if we found a button, then we're just gonna return that button. So return I. So this will return us the number of the button that was pressed. So here in a P turn, that's where animation is playing, we're gonna go um, butt buff equals get butt. Oh yeah, by the way, if we loop through all of our buttons and there is nothing inside, we're gonna go return minus one as a button that doesn't exist. Like no, no, no button is basically minus one. And that's why we started out with minus one here. Okay, so now what we can do is um, we can go, we can actually send all of our inputs through this butt buff. We're gonna go butt buff equals get butt. And then a second, um, <laughs> A second function we're going to give you do but, like do whatever this button does, uh, and we're going to go but buff. Oh no, we're actually we're going to go like if but buff equals minus one, then something like this. And this part, uh, we're gonna also put its own own function. We're gonna call this function do but but. And here we don't have to loop through all of the buttons anymore. We just have to like see. So we're gonna go if but is greater than zero. And so first of all, if but uh, equals or is smaller than zero, then then nothing happens. If but is greater than zero and but is smaller than four, then uh, move player uh, and it's gonna be instead of the I, we're gonna go to use the but. And then return. And then here is later when we can do like um, menu button. Okay, I hope this was a lot of code, but I hope this is kind of like understandable what we did. We kind of like started using this uh, butt buff, this button buffer, um, and we're putting like all of the inputs of the recent inputs inside this button buffer. Um, and if um, also like even the regular inputs while the animation is not playing, we also put into this button buffer. And if the, we notice that, you know, and then we just like do have a function that like executes whatever a button is associated with. Uh, if the button buffer is minus one, that means no button was pressed or no button was remembered. And in this case, we just re return, uh, we just do nothing. Uh, there's, I think, one more thing that we have to do. We have to somewhere reset the button buffer to minus one after it was used. Yeah, you have to go like button buff equals minus one. Because otherwise, if you do this, uh, this might be, might have a, uh, there's a bit of a problem. If, then, oh, there's no end here. Uh, I wonder, if we, I think we found out that there is actually no, so it's 451. Because there's a different way of doing if statements using these kind of like um, parentheses. But yeah, that's actually not doesn't save any space. So we can just as well use the end here. Uh, I was checking if this is um, less tokens or not. So if you do like, like this, uh, let us make, what, what is the problem here? Oh, there's a nil happening. Oh, there's a T, I forgot. Oh, it works. Weird. Yeah, but uh, also, oh, also it doesn't actually work anymore now. Like it stopped working for some reason. So I think what you have to do is something like this here. Let's try it. Now, funny enough, this doesn't work. Um, Why? We have to do the same same question here. So, because 
if somebody, so if, if the animation is playing, you press the button, that button should be stored in a buffer. Uh, but if you release the button, that, rem that button that was remembered should remain in the buffer, obviously. So, um, so we have to check, like we, we only store a button in the buffer if there is no button stored. Because this get button uh, function also releases uh, returns minus one if no button was pressed, um, and uh, the way we had set up, set up right now was like it remembered the last the last thing uh, the last result of the get button function, and in, in our case it was um, it was minus one. Now I cannot walk to the left anymore, <laughs> but otherwise it works. Like it's buffering the inputs. If I press twice, it actually goes twice. Um, so oops, I saved the screenshot. Um, so let me see why it doesn't let me go to the left. Ah, it's because here it's greater than zero. So it's supposed to be is greater equals zero. Yeah, now it works. So you can see now we have like way more responsive, uh, way, more, way more responsive uh, control here. You can see that the game is buffering at least one input, not too many. So if I press three times, uh, it's worked. If I'm really fast, uh, it's it's it will skip inputs. But I think for a roguelike like this, it's fine. For a game that would be like a fighting game or something, for that kind of game, mm, I would actually think about maybe maybe um, doing a more complicated buffer input, where it actually when you can input like you know long animations playing and you input you know the like next special move already. But in this case, I think it's fine to just like have a button for one in button input. So this is a really nice responsive game. Cool. So uh, in the next episode, I think we are going to add some sound effects and then we're going to start doing uh, some UI work actually. So what I want to be doing next is this thing where I bump against this stone wall. I want to display a message. That's something that I think would be fun to do. And, and I think like a lot of you guys who want to make an RPG and might not want to go into the depth of, you know, actually doing like a, um, a random uh, dungeon generation, that I think that's going to be a, like, a very useful feature, a very useful um, uh, system, how to display uh, messages. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, as, a, as always, uh, down in the doobly-doo is going to be the code, this code that we had at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the episode. And uh, you, I remind you that if you join the Discord, you can play the prototype of this game already. Uh, and there's going to be lots of nice people hanging out there that can like discuss with you, you know, your games and stuff like that. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.